For thousands of years, bonding or joining metals has been deep rooted in the history of human civilization, as far as the Bronze and Iron Age in Europe and the Middle East. One of the earliest examples came from the construction of the Iron Pillar of Delhi, erected in Delhi, India about 310 AD. The Iron Pillar of Delhi weighs an astonishing 5.4 metric tons and is famous for the rust-resistant composition of the alloys used in its creation. According to archaeologists, the pillar is a testimony to the high level of skill achieved by the ancient Indian ironsmiths in the extraction and processing of iron. As civilization transitioned into the Middle Ages, further advancements in forge welding began to surface. Forge welding is a solid-state process in which two pieces of metal are merged by heating them to temperatures high enough that result in plastic deformation and then striking or pressing them together. This was accomplished by blacksmiths who repeatedly hammered heated metal until bonding occurred. Moreover, this process is the simplest way in which early civilizations join metals. Further into the Renaissance period, craftsmen skilled in the process refined their proficiency and the industry progressed and saw growth in the centuries to come. By the 1800s, the discovery of the short pulse electrical arc was founded by Sir Humphrey Davy who presented his results the following year. An arc was generated and suspended in the air between two carbon electrodes using a battery. The illumination produced from the arc was credited as the first practical electric light and was widely used as lighting for streets and large buildings in the 1870s, but only to be superseded by incandescent lighting by the early 20th century. Two years after Davy's discovery, the continuous electric arc was created by Vasily Petrov, a Russian scientist. The following year, he published the results of his experiments and the significance of prolonged electrical discharge or stable arc discharge. In his paper, Petrov emphasized its use for a multitude of applications, especially for melting metals. In 1881, the first electric arc welding method was created by inventors Nikolai Bernardos and Stanislaw Oswalski, known as carbon arc welding. With this method, carbon electrodes are used to generate an electric arc between the electrode itself and the base materials. The temperatures produced were high enough to form a bond between separate metals that eventually become welded. By the late 1800s, arc welding saw further advancements with the invention of metal electrodes pioneered by Russian inventor Nikolai Slavonov, an American engineer CL Coffin. Metal electrodes later improved around the 1900s with the development of a metal mixture coating called flux. The flux would give off gases as it decomposed to prevent wall contamination. This new design was accredited to British scientist A.P. Strumminger, which gave a more stable arc and improved the overall well quality. As the 20th century progressed, a plethora of welding methods such as resistance welding, thermite welding, and oxyfuel welding was developed, but fell out of favor for industrial applications. They were largely replaced with arc welding, as headway was made in the advancements of flux. The benefit of flux coating the electrode is the gas shield it creates to protect the base material from impurities. During World War I, welding saw a shift in demand as military powers used it in the construction of their fleets. The British Army primarily used arc welding and to an extent, to construct the hull of some of their ships. Arc welding's applications extended to the construction of aircraft for the first time during the war. In fact, some German fuselages were even constructed using this process. The 1920s then saw the introduction of automatic welding in which spooled electrode wire was fed continuously. But the biggest hurdle was how to protect walls from the effects of oxygen and nitrogen in the atmosphere, which led to issues with porosity and brittleness. This prompted the next breakthrough in welding technology with the use of shielding gas. Some of the solutions included the use of hydrogen, argon, and helium gas as a welding atmosphere to insulate the base materials. The following decades saw additional improvements in the welding of reactive metals like aluminum and magnesium, which fed a major expansion of arc welding during the 1930s and World War II. Now that we have a better understanding of some of the history of arc welding, Let's dive further into the process itself. The fundamental idea of arc welding is to utilize electricity 
to generate enough heat in which metal reaches its melting point. The manipulation of the molten metal at the welding region can then be used to bond the base material with other metals as cooling takes place. It should be noted that the scope of this section will be on shielded metal arc welding or manual arc welding, also known as stick welding. Though many of the principles do overlap other welding methods. In stick welding, an electric current is used to strike an arc between the base metal and the consumable electrode rod. Typically, the rod is made up of a steel core that is used as a filler material, making a separate filler unnecessary. It's also covered with a coating called flux that burns and decomposes during the welding process. As the flux vaporizes, it produces gas, typically CO2, that acts as a guard to preserve the integrity of the weld and protect the welding region from oxidation and contamination. As the rod is manipulated, fusion occurs between the base metal and the weld metal. The versatility of stick welding makes it easily accessible, especially since the equipment needed is relatively inexpensive. An end user can reach high levels of proficiency with a moderate amount of training. However, the greatest disadvantage of this method is the length of weld times. This is because the consumable electrodes must be frequently replaced and the deposit created from the flux, known as slag, must be brushed away. Additionally, welding ferrous materials are generally a limiting factor of stick welding. Though the welding of cast iron, nickel, aluminum, copper, and other metals has been made possible by specially designed electrode rods. Moreover, the average weld time saw a decrease with the introduction of gas metal arc welding, commonly called MIG welding. In this process, consumable wire that doubles as both the electrode and the filler material is continuously fed from a spool. As the wire is fed through the tip of the welder, an inert or semi-inert gas flows around it to protect the weld from contamination. The benefit here is the quality, versatility, and relatively high welding speeds, which is why MIG welding is commonly used in industries such as automotive and manufacturing. Another popular form of welding is gas tungsten arc welding, or TIG welding. The underlying difference with TIG welding is the non-consumable tungsten electrode and separate filler material it uses. The TIG method is characterized by stable arc and high quality welds, which makes it useful for welding thin materials, and most often stainless steel. For this reason, TIG welding is used in aircraft and naval applications where weld quality is an important factor. While the welding methods mentioned so far are usually done in controlled environments, such as a repair shop or manufacturing setting, some welding methods are commonly used in a wide array of conditions, such as underwater or in space. Hyperbaric welding is the process of welding in high pressure conditions. It can either take place underwater or within a specially constructed positive pressure enclosure that acts as a dry environment. Often, this method is used to repair ships, offshore oil platforms, and pipelines, with steel being the most ubiquitous material welded. Commonly, it's referred to as dry hyperbaric welding when used in a dry environment, and as the name suggests, underwater welding in a wet environment. Dry hyperbaric welding involves welding at elevated pressures in an enclosed chamber, usually filled with a gas mixture sealed around the welded structure. The majority of arc welding methods, such as shielded metal arc welding or stick welding, MIG and TIG welding, could be performed at hyperbaric pressures, but lose effectiveness as the pressure increases. The decrease in effectiveness is attributed to the physical differences in the arc behavior, as the gas flowing around the arc changes from the varying pressure. The root of the arc contracts and becomes erratic. The increase in pressure also affects the arc voltage, contributing to the degradation in the overall capability and efficiency of the welding results. Because of these limitations, dry hyperbaric welding has been limited operationally to less than 400 meters or 1300 feet in depth, mostly because of the psychological capability of divers to operate the welding equipment at such high pressures. On the other hand, a driver and electrode, as well as the surrounding elements are directly exposed during underwater welding. With this method, a diver would use approximately 300 to 400 amps of direct current to power their electrode. Additionally, they would use a variation of shielded arc welding that employs a waterproof electrode that is specially designed for water cooling and is heavily insulated. For this reason, the electrode would overheat if it were used outside of the water. Moreover, the power supply is connected to the welding equipment through a series of waterproof cables and hoses. Generally, wet welding is limited to low carbon steels because of the hydrogen cracking produced at greater depths. 
The process starts as the underwater welder instructs an operator at the surface to turn on a heavy-duty inline isolation switch located on the welding cable. The surface control switch allows the operator to break the welding current at the contacts when it's not in use, particularly when changing electrodes. When the operator turns the switch to the on position and closes the circuit, the electric arc heats the electrode in the welding region. At this point, molten metal is moved through the gas bubble and around the arc as the welder manipulates the electrode. The gas bubble is formed as the flux coating surrounding the electrode decomposes from the heat, though some contamination does occur as the water steams. As the slag forms on the welded surface, cooling occurs almost instantly. The challenge here is the rapid cooling which hinders any effort in producing a quality weld. Though advancements in underwater welding have been slow to automate the profession, one of the biggest dangers facing divers is delta P hazards or differential pressure. This danger presents a unique and potentially fatal condition for the profession. When intersecting bodies of water overlap at varying depths, a pressure difference is created as the water from one level attempts to rush to the next level. The difference in pressure can accumulate to hundreds of pounds of square inch. And since it's almost undetectable, a diver can become trapped and has an incredibly high risk of drowning. Despite the future outlook, today underwater welders maintain the most integral components of many industries until advancements in robotics and automation can perform the intricate tasks similar to the dexterity of a human. Underwater welders will continue to be a necessity.